Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is the last lecture of the semester, and the topic is reproducible bioinformatics. So why is it important as scientists that our work is reproducible? Well, for a lot of reasons. Um, the first is that it enables essential validation by ourselves or by others. Um, and so it allows somebody else or us in the future to go back and, and try and do what we did and make sure that we get the same result. This is um, important for ensuring that what may, be become, uh, what may become the subject of future research um, or that may even become um, future applications such as medical treatments um, is based on sound, uh, uh, sound data and sound methods. Um, it also helps to build confidence in our work. And so if somebody else can see what you did, if you described what you did in a way that somebody else can reproduce, they uh, tend to be less skeptical of your findings. And so if they can see that you're putting all this effort into documenting what you did and they can follow along, even if they don't intend to validate it themselves, it can help build their confidence that you know what you're doing and that you're doing things correctly. Another reason why it's important that our work is reproducible is that it saves us time. Um, and so, you know, if you make uh, an effort to make sure that your work is reproducible um, by somebody else, it will save you time when you are writing a paper or writing a thesis or writing a grant because you'll know exactly what you did. Um, and you'll have that described in a way that you could reproduce it if you need to. Um, often you'll do an analysis, um, several months or even years will go by, and you will need to come back and um, understand what you did, um, either to describe it to somebody else or maybe write, um, write this up as preliminary data for a grant report. And if you have um, detailed logs of what you did in such a way that somebody else could reproduce it, that's just going to save you a ton of time in figuring out um, how to write this up for um, one of these uh, venues. <clears throat> the other thing that I like to remind my students um, is that if they spend time documenting what they do, um, that is going to save them time um, when we are, say, like wrapping up a paper for submission. It's very common that, um, you know, when we're doing, say, a microbiome study, um, we may experiment with a lot of things along the way. We may try different approaches for, say, doing taxonomy assignment um, or managing uh, controls. If everything is well documented, um, Sorry, um, when it comes to the um, comes to the time when we are ready to submit a final paper on this, we often will go back and redo the entire analysis, um, and we will do that because, like at that point, we know exactly what analysis steps we want to run, what order we want to run them in, what things we don't care about, and so if um, the person who has um, Oh, sorry. And one other thing, like we may then want, uh, we may then need to run this with like the most recent version of the software that we're using, um, just before paper submission. And so if the person who is doing those analyses, um, was very diligent about documenting what they did at each step along the way, what worked, what didn't work, um, then redoing an analysis before final submission, um, I won't say trivial, but it becomes very straightforward to do. Um, and I'm going to show you examples of how I document um, some of my own analyses to facilitate reproducibility. Um, but ensuring reproducibility of our work is hard. It requires very diligent documentation. Um, and reproducibility in computing um, may be harder than, um, than some other um, areas, maybe not. Um, 
But many biologists haven't been trained in how to ensure reproducibility of their computational work. Um, and so it may be the case that um, biologists sometimes have a harder time describing their bioinformatics work in a way that can be reproduced than say their lab techniques. Probably depends on, um, probably depends a lot on the person. Um, what, which of those is harder, documenting lab techniques or documenting computational techniques. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that I do in my own work to ensure that it's reproducible. Um, I want to point out a couple of things before I do that. Um, first of all, these are my systems. Um, everybody's systems are going to be a little bit different. So I'm not showing you what I do um, and saying that this is what you should do. I'm just showing you what I do to give you an example of how I document my work. Um, and nobody is perfect. There are things that I have published um, over the course of my career that I would have a hard time reproducing today, either because I didn't keep good enough notes um, or because maybe some of the software is not accessible or the data is not accessible anymore. Um, and so uh, the way I view it is like full re reproducibility of our work is something that we're always striving for. Um, and, you know, something that we should try really hard to achieve. Um, but there may be times where, you know, we don't hit that target perfectly. Um, okay, so let's um, first talk about um, what reproducibility means. Um, and then I will work through some examples um, showing you how I document my work. So let's look at a few related terms to talk about what reproducibility means. Um, this figure came from the Turing Way, which I have linked down at the bottom of this slide. Um, and I like this because it shows um, a couple different axes here and what we should be thinking about. Um, and so when I am talking about computational reproducibility, what I typically mean is that the data is the same and the analysis is the same. Um, and so that puts us in the top quadrant of this figure here. Um, and so, you know, the way to think about that is like you ran an analysis on a particular data set today. Um, if it's reproducible, you should be able to come back and run that same analysis um, on the same data next week. Um, now that is useful primarily for um, validation, also for um, uh, reproducing, say, some analysis that you did, like we talked about where like you need to um, do the exact same analysis to submit along with a paper that you did in an exploratory phase. Um, now, um, if Instead, um, you wanted to apply the same analysis to different data, um, that would get us into the category of replicability. Um, and so this is very important, but for different reasons. And so what this allows you to determine is if you would see the same analysis result um, on some different data set. And so imagine that you had something like, um, human microbiome samples, say from subjects in the United States, you did some analysis um, and you want to see, um, you know, maybe you want to explore that pattern on um, individuals in another country. Um, you might try and replicate that analysis, meaning you're going to do the same analysis, but on uh, data generated from different subjects to see if those findings um, are replicated in a different population. Um, uh, the term robust in here would refer to the same data, but a different analysis method. And so a good example, um, again, focusing on microbiome research here, might be, um, you know, if we apply, say, the Unifrac, um, unweighted Unifrac diversity metric, and the Jacquard diversity metric to the same data. If we get the same results, we draw, say, the same conclusion from that data, 
that tells us that the finding that we have um, is robust. And so it's not just something that you would observe if you use this exact same analysis method. Um, but if you uh, say take a different view of um, you know, what beta diversity means or what distances between samples means, you would still come to the same conclusion. You could also approach that, um, you know, thinking about using different software altogether. Um, and so if you did an analysis with Chime on some data set, um, you then might want to try and analyze that with another related, uh, or sorry, another unrelated microbiome analysis software package to see if your findings are robust to your choice of analysis software. Um, and finally, um, generalizable. Um, so generalizable would mean that the data is different, the analysis is different, but you would be testing to see if the findings are the same. Um, and so if somebody uses Chime to analyze that United States data and they observe some interesting pattern in there, if somebody else uses a different software pattern, our software platform and they are analyzing say European data um, that allows us to figure out well do the findings generalize across populations across analysis tools and that really starts to suggest when we're onto something um, with a new scientific idea um, and so I'm going to focus um, on reproducibility for this analysis um, because that's really the first step I think in any of this and it's um, really the first thing that we need to uh, do as bioinformaticians reporting on our work is we need to ensure that it is reproducible by others. Um, and so I have a list up here of the items in my mind that are needed for reproducing a bioinformatics analysis. Um, so remember, reproducing would mean same, so same analysis, same data. Um, and so in order for somebody to reproduce something that we did, they need to know what software we used. And so that would be our analysis um, platform in this case. Um, including any version numbers um, of the software or software packages that we're using. Um, to hit that other axis, um, they are also going to need access to data and metadata. Um, and so that data, um, you know, should be made accessible to um, ensure reproducibility of this work. Um, so far, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the next step, though, is, um, and this is where um, people sometimes start to lose track of this, um, is you should report all successful commands that you used in this analysis in the order that they were applied. And I'm going to show you an example of this in just a minute. Um, the idea here is that, like, as you are preparing your final analysis, um, what you should be doing is just keeping track of everything that worked and that got you closer to that final analysis. If you tried something a few different ways and you got an error message and you had to modify some things, you don't need to um, keep track of all that. You might want to make some notes to yourself um, just in case you have to do something similar in the future. Um, you know, if you think it might be something that would be helpful to have a reminder of. Um, but as far as publication, as far as giving somebody the tools that they need to reproduce your work, um, just share the successful commands. Um, and finally, the computational environment um, where the analysis was performed is needed to be able to reproduce a bioinformatics analysis. And this part can be really challenging. Um, and so this is where not just um, say the version of the software that you're using, say this is Chime 2, it's not just the Chime 2 version, but what about the software that Chime 2 depends on? Um, you'll need versions of that information. It may also be helpful to have information about what operating system you ran this on. Um, and so that information um, is very complicated to compile. And so for that reason, I recommend that 
whenever you are doing analyses, you are working in some, like an environment manager, like Anaconda, that's how we distribute Chime 2, um, or working on a virtual machine, um, or using a container, like a Docker container, for example. Um, if you do that, you can um, mostly just point to that environment. Um, so you can say, I was running this with the Chime 21, uh, or sorry, 2021.4 Anaconda environment. Um, and that will allow somebody to create the environment where all of the commands that you provide will work and should work um, exactly as they did on uh, when you ran them. Um, yeah, so that's um, so that's what I want to say about that. Um, okay, so I talked about keeping track of the commands that you ran. And the way that I think about this is that I keep a computational lab notebook when I'm working on an analysis. Um, and so these are um, a few different types of notebooks that I, that I uh, maintain. These are actually for the same analysis. Um, and so you can see like what I'm doing here, I just, you know, nothing too fancy. I'm just doing this in Google Docs. Um, and what you can see is I have like some annotations in here. And so like, for example, I've got some notes in here on, you know, some abbreviations that I'm using in the text. Um, and then I have all of the commands that I ran. Um, I also, it looks like up here, I'm describing what I'm doing, what um, software version I'm using. So in my shorthand, this um, will refer to Chime 2 2019.7. You can see that this, um, I was working on this back in 2019. So this was probably the most recent version of Chime 2 that was available at that time. Um, and so, you know, these documents can end up getting pretty cluttered, but that's fine. Um, you know, what I do is I'll keep track of my notes and I'll keep track of my commands in here. And then as I'm starting to wrap things up, like when I'm getting ready to submit a paper, I'll go through and I'll clean that up while it's all fresh in my mind. You know, that's the time when I might remember, um, oh, I decided, you know, not to include these analyses. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and I'll strip that stuff out um, at that time. Um, if I am writing a little bit of custom code for an analysis, um, so for example, if I need to do something like with the metadata, um, or if I want to automate a component of my analysis workflow, um, I will typically do that with Jupyter Notebooks, same tool we've been working with all semester. Um, and so then, you know, I might have something like this where, um, you know, I'm doing some importing um, here. It looks like I'm doing some metadata cleanup maybe. Um, and then I'm running a bunch of diversity metrics. Um, and so if I'm ever writing little kind of bits of custom code for an analysis, I'll do that in a Jupyter notebook. And then it's very easy to save that and just keep it um, for future reference. Um, what I do with those um, so that I don't lose track of them is I manage them in um, a GitHub repository that is usually associated with a specific analysis project. Um, and so here you can see that this was um, some analyses that I was doing for the exercise microbiome projects. Um, and in this GitHub repository, I have some code I have some data. Um, I keep my sample metadata in there just because um, then I'm never guessing about what my most recent sample metadata was. Um, and you can see, I actually have an environment.txt file here. Um, and so this is um, basically a conda environment exported to a file. And so um, going back a couple slides, working in conda environments helps you manage um, reproducibility of that environment because now I can always go and grab this and either figure out what versions of Chimes dependencies I had installed um, or I could recreate that environment if I needed to. Um, 
that all of that, you know, that this idea of environments, it may sound a little bit complicated if you haven't used this before. Um, it's a good thing to, um, you know, if you're starting a bioinformatics analysis for a project, um, get advice from somebody who has more experience um, or do some reading about how to ensure reproducibility of your bioinformatics work. Um, they may be able to help you with things like anaconda environments or um, Docker containers, so on. Um, so I also, I have this data directory here, um, but the um, this is not the primary spot where I store my data um, for an analysis like this. Um, what I store in that data directory is typically things like the um, core Chime 2 artifacts that I was working with. Um, and so here, like you can see, I've got a phylogenetic tree, I have a feature table, um, I have some taxonomic annotations. Um, and so I store that information in this repository, but the bigger files, um, so for example, things um, like my raw sequence data, I will typically store in another long-term archival repository. Um, a good example of an archival repository for microbiome data is the NCBI short read, or, or sorry, NCBI sequence read archive, SRA. Um, and so the SRA is a federally managed resource. Um, and the benefit of that is that, um, you know, we can put our data in there and unless something really drastic changes, um, that data will continue to be accessible. Um, and that funding for that resource is provided by um, the federal government. And so, you know, as long as all of that remains stable, that data should be accessible in the future. Um, now, putting data on GitHub um, is probably pretty safe, um, but, you know, it's a commercial organization. They could take this whole site down tomorrow if they wanted to. Um, I doubt that they will. Um, I generally feel pretty good about putting my data um, in there for, um, for some archiving or for some backup, but I typically, you know, wouldn't rely on this. Um, in general, you want to um, rely on long-term archival um, resources for um, your, your core data. Um, and a good practice is to take something like this GitHub repository and submit it um, as a zip file along with the manuscript for publication. Um, and so one thing that I will often do is I'll either download the entire repository as a zip file when I submit my paper and attach it as a supplementary file, or I'll put it in, um, I'll, I'll put a version of it in something like Zenodo or um, Figshare where I can get a DOI, a digital object identifier associated with that particular um, snapshot of my GitHub repository. Um, if I have my data in those kind of resources, then I feel a lot better about it. So just to summarize, um, I keep these lab notebooks. Um, I didn't mention this, but like this commands document, I would often export as a PDF and submit that as a supplementary methods document. Um, then this GitHub repository is great for providing um, either myself or others easy access to code and data, um, maybe environment files that I created during the course of an analysis, um, but it's good to have that in another repository as well. And so you can put your GitHub, um, a snapshot of your GitHub repository in Zenodo or Figshare, and you should put your raw data in whatever the relevant repository is for the type of data that you're working with. Um, for me, that is often going to be the NCBI sequence read archive. Um, it's not always necessarily very convenient to get my data in there, um, but it, uh, 
it's worth it because I know that the data will be there. If somebody's looking for it five years down the road or 10 years down the road, they don't have to come to me. They can just go to that long-term repository and access the data. Um, the other thing that I want to mention while we're on this topic um, is what Chime 2 does to support reproducibility. Now, we've looked at this a couple times throughout the course of the semester, but I want to show you um, Chime 2's data provenance one more time. Um, and so I'm going to click this link so that I can do this interactively. I'm going to resize my window here. Um, and so what I'm looking at here is an interactive um, visualization from Chime 2 that is tracking um, change in abundance of microbial organisms over time. Um, the provenance tab in here um, keeps track or um, presents information that Chime 2 has kept track of on exactly what I did to um, uh, perform this analysis. Um, and so you can see down here at the bottom, um, if I click this circle down at the bottom, that um, represents the current result that I'm looking at. And so that is this visualization. Um, the box surrounding that tells me what command I used um, to generate that. Um, and so this doesn't look like a command as you've seen them so far. Um, so for example, as you were um, using to run your own Chime 2 analyses, but all of the information needed to construct that command is recorded in here. Um, and so that includes like what plugin um, I used to run this, what action I ran. Um, and so those two things together um, tell me that I ran Chime longitudinal feature volatility as the beginning of my command. Um, it gives me some information about what my inputs were, um, about what values I provided for um, specific parameters. Um, and if I keep scrolling down here, um, I can see like I can get versions of the software that I used. Um, and I can actually get quite a lot of detail about the environment where this was run. And so you can see that um, this was run um, in an environment that had all of these Python dependencies installed. Now, this is not a complete description of the environment um, right now. Um, so it doesn't replace the need for you to do your own record keeping. Um, but think of Chime's provenance as supplementing your record keeping. Um, if I were to keep clicking, like working my way up here, um, what I could see is that I can trace my analysis um, all the way back through all of the steps that I did um, to get to that final result. And so, for example, here, um, at some point, I ran a command um, called denoise single. Um, these were the parameters that I provided. Um, again, you can see um, what versions of all the software I was using. Um, and if I go all the way back, um, you can see that this is where I imported my data into Chime 2. And so it's where I took some raw sequence files, FASTQ files, um, and imported them. And when I import them, then Chime is able to start tracking the provenance. Um, and so this, um, this functionality that we built into Chime 2 was in response to um, people having a difficult time um, describing their microbiome analyses in a way that others could reproduce them. Um, and so we built this functionality in to support better, um, better uh, reproducibility. Um, and more and more um, bioinformatics platforms are starting to incorporate at least um, some ideas um, of provenance tracking. Um, there's not um, many that do many um, platforms out there that do this right now, but Chime is not alone. There are others that generate this kind of information. Um, and so that's something to be aware of as you are doing your analyses. Is the software doing some provenance tracking for me? Um, or is, is, is this something that I need to fully manage on my own? 
Um, now you'll notice like if we go, um, if you look at those, uh, that notebook that I shared with you a few minutes ago, um, even though Chang2 records provenance, I typically um, keep track of that myself as well. And so I will um, keep track of all of these successful commands that I ran in an analysis. Um, and that is mostly just so that if I need to do it again, or if I want to reference it so that I can replicate an analysis on a different data set, that I have all of those commands easily accessible and I can just run that again. Um, and so um, in summary here, Chime 2 does some things to help you ensure reproducibility of your work. Um, but it's not a bad habit to just record everything that you're doing anyway. Okay, so that wraps up what I want to say on the topic of reproducibility right now. Um, again, that was you know just a very quick overview. As you start doing some of your own analyses, um, think about this ahead of time, like how you're going to do the analysis in a way that you're going to be able to reproduce it when you come back to it. Um, it's something that you really do need to start thinking about right at the beginning of the project. And so right when you're getting ready to um, just do your initial processing of the data. The um, best recommendation, um, you know, if you're going to take a single thing away from this lecture, is keep a good computational lab notebook. And that should look a lot like what your wet lab notebook looks like. So every step that you're doing, um, you know, instead of what specific reagents you're using, um, you know, note what specific versions of software you're using, note what you did, um, what worked, what didn't work. Um, so we've come a long way this semester. Um, we started out by talking about biological information and relating that to um, how computers manage information. Um, we talked about um, some uh, studies in microbiome science um, and briefly talked about some methods early in the semester um, to contextualize some of the work that we're going to do later on in the semester. Um, we then spent some time with Python programming, um, learning about pairwise sequence alignment algorithms, applying those algorithms to do database searching, um, and then we even got to scratch the surface a little bit on the very broad area of machine learning and how that work, uh, how those techniques are used in biology. Um, more recently, we started wrapping up the course by bringing pieces together and talking about doing a full microbiome analysis. Um, we then um, started wrapping up with talking about getting help as you jump into your own microbiome analyses. And then today with talking about um, reproducing bioinformatics analyses. Um, so like I said in the beginning of the semester, the goal is not that you're going to leave here an expert in bioinformatics. Um, this is a vast subject area um, that uh, you know, covers many different um, uh, uh, covers many different fields. So statistics, data visualization, biology, software engineering. Um, so you're you know you're not going to leave an expert after one semester. Um, but my hope is that this has demystified bioinformatics for you a little bit and maybe even whet your appetite to learn a little bit more about this. Um, now, I also um, said in the beginning of the semester that we were going to push you out of your comfort zone a little bit. Um, and I knew um, that we did that with, um, for example, with Python programming or with using Chime 2 or in exploring an algorithm like pairwise sequence alignment and looking at the computational complexity of that. Um, this is, um, you know, I've heard from folks over the course of the semester, you know, this is hard. I even heard once or twice, you know, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not good with computers. This is not for me. Um, and so I just wanted to um, share a few thoughts on that. Um, so the stuff that we learned this semester definitely is complex. It takes time to master. 
um, but you can learn this stuff and it will help advance your career in biology. Um, biology is very data intensive science right now and it's only going to continue to get more and more data intensive. Um, and so investing some time at this point in your career at learning some skills for managing that data and working with that data will empower you to do your own research. Um, for example, to not be reliant on, um, on say a programmer to carry out your work. Um, now that doesn't mean that you have to become a master programmer, but just, you know, knowing a little bit, knowing a little bit of Python, um, knowing a little bit of, uh, interacting with command line software on a supercomputer, um, just spending some time learning that stuff will let you move quicker with a lot of the day-to-day -day things that you're going to have to do as a biologist. Um, and I can, I can relate to that feeling of being overwhelmed and scared. Um, so when I started um, as an undergraduate, um, I started as an art major, fine art major. Um, I was at the University of Colorado. Um, I uh, did that for a little while. I explored some other majors. Um, and I had always kind of been interested in computers. And so I ended up, um, I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go with my career. Um, and so I was exploring some courses and I ended up taking a computer science one course, um, dove into it. I took it over a summer semester and I was able to really dive into it that semester. I didn't have any other classes. Um, and so I spent a lot of time learning about it and I did pretty well in that course. Um, it in fact convinced me, okay, I think I want to do this. I think I might change my major to computer science. Um, and so I did that. And then the next semester I took computer science two, um, which is a course usually called data structures. Um, and I remember my first day of data structures, um, we, I got access to a new, um, computer science lab that was for computer science majors. Um, and I went in and I was going to start working on my first assignment and I turned on the computer and all there was, was a command prompt in front of me. There was no graphical interface. I just had, um, you know, like a, a dollar sign and a flashing cursor, like you may have seen at some point over the course of the semester. Um, and I distinctly remember sitting there looking at the computer screen and thinking, oh no, what have I done? I, I cannot do this. I don't understand how to work with a command terminal like this. And I thought I made a huge mistake. And I literally remember thinking, I cannot do this. But I did, um, you know, I learned it. Um, I invested some time and as I spent more time with it, I got more and more comfortable with it. Um, I think of it, um, a lot like playing a musical instrument. And so, you know, if somebody hands you a guitar or a piano or a banjo or whatever, um, and you've never played it before, when you first start, you're, you're just going to be making noises. You're not going to be making music. You're going to be, you're going to be, you know, banging on keys or picking strings. Um, and it's not going to sound like anything, but if you spend a little bit of time with it every day, you know, spend 15 minutes with it, or maybe when you get a little more into it, maybe you start spending a half an hour or an hour with it every day, you start to build those skills and you know, what just sounded like noise in the beginning, um, progresses to sounding um, something like music at some point. Um, and so, you know, learning to program, getting comfortable with computers is really similar. When you sit down and you look at a terminal the first time, you're going to be lost. Um, you're not going to know what to do. You're going to type stuff in. You're going to get error messages. Um, and it's going to be frustrating and you might feel like you can never do it. But if you just put a little bit of time into it every day, find some good resources to help you learn, find some friends who know a little bit more about it than you do um, and who are willing to answer some questions, before long, you're going to start running commands that work. Um, 
And you know, if you really get into it, you might even start writing some of your own code to um, make your analyses more efficient in the future. Um, so take away the fact that um, you know you may feel right now like this class was really hard and I can't do this. This is not for me. Um, but take it from me if you know if I could figure this stuff out, I promise you you can figure this stuff out too. Um, okay, so um, where to go next? Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, if I have um, what your appetite for this course, um, this semester, um, maybe try and find a research position, maybe volunteer um, in a lab that has some bioinformatics needs and learn the software that they use and learn to apply that software. That's how I got started. Um, I was, um, so I did this computer science degree. Um, I actually went and worked as a computer scientist for a little while, but wasn't satisfied with the job. Ended up um, taking some biology classes because um, I thought I might be interested in studying medicine. Um, but ended up meeting a, um, a, a faculty member at University of Colorado who is doing some bioinformatics research. And we started working together. I got to learn the things that he was working on and try and start helping out. Um, and because I didn't really have bioinformatics skills at that time, I started out as a research volunteer. Um, and so I wasn't getting paid for it, but I was learning a lot. I got some independent credit study for it um, eventually. Um, but you know that is a really great way to get started. Um, and you may find a paid position, um, but you know, if volunteer positions are the only ones available, um, it, you know, don't let that stop you from, don't let you know, the lack of um, funding stop you from pursuing this because it probably can turn into something like a funded position if, um, you know, you're, if you're enjoying it and it's something you wanna stick with. Um, of course, that's you know not always going to be possible. Like maybe you you don't have the time to volunteer. There are paid positions out there as well. Um, as far as next steps in learning, um, learning a programming language um, will get will be really helpful um, for you. And so I would recommend. Um, it doesn't matter so much what programming language you learn, but if you're going to pick one and you're interested in bioinformatics, I would pick either Python 3 or R. Um, those at the moment are probably the most widely used um, programming languages in bioinformatics. That can change, um, so that might not be the case two or three years down the road. But if you are, you know, picking something to um, to start learning today, April 2021, um, those are uh, good choices for languages to get started with. Um, there is so much content out there on the internet for learning to program. Um, there's a lot of great resources. Um, in fact, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And so, um, you know, it's good to get recommendations. So if you want to learn Python or you want to learn R, um, see if you can find somebody to recommend a good resource to you. Um, the other thing that is great to do, like if you are interested in bioinformatics and you've got a um, a field of biology that you're interested in, so maybe you're really interested in human genomics or you're really interested um, in uh, 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 immunoproteomics, whatever it happens to be, um, find out what software tools are being used in that area and just try and learn them a little bit. Um, so a lot of uh, bioinformatics tools will have online tutorials. Um, go and follow their uh, instructions for um, learning this um, and learning this software and just figure out if you can use it and try it out. Um, there's also enormous amounts of public data out there now um, and so it's pretty easy to um, you know, find some data that you can work with um, with a tool if you're trying to learn it. Um, okay, so that is where I am going to wrap things up. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is 
um, that you know as you progress in your career over the next couple of, couple of years or more um, feel free to get in touch with me um, so you can um, you can reach me at my NAU address um, keep in touch let me know if you're going to uh, move on in bioinformatics I'd love to hear about that and what you're gonna do um, if you have some questions about career opportunities grad school opportunities always feel free to reach out with uh, reach out to me um, we also uh, my lab holds um, public office hours we have suspended them right now due to the pandemic um, but when we are all getting back into our offices we will be holding office hours uh, again and so you can feel free to come see me in my office hours anytime in the future um, or if you've got specific questions say about Chang 2 or other bioinformatics stuff um, you uh, can also feel free to visit office hours of the uh, students and staff in my lab um, okay well I have enjoyed working with you this semester um, and I hope to hear from you again in the future have a great summer <laughs>